Uh, case 25, what's this? So this is blue, 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 pale, and hypocellular, kind of a lobulated nodule. Uh, so the blue hypocellularity makes me think of myxoid, and we certainly can also see there are small vascular spaces in here. Good. So put those together and we could get an angiomyxoma. Very good. It's a nice example of superficial angiomyxoma, which in my opinion is the same exact thing as cutaneous myxoma. And I think that's important because the cutaneous myxomas look a good bit different from like deep intramuscular myxoma. So uh, those are both called myxoma, but they are probably two separate things because they don't look like each other. The, the cells may have some similarity. You have, you have myxoid change with hypocellular bland spindle cells. Sometimes you get these kind of bean-shaped nuclei with little blobs of pink cytoplasm. I feel like those are more commonly seen in the deep intramuscular myxomas and not as much in the superficial um, cutaneous myxomas. But the main difference is that the vascularity is more abundant in cutaneous myxomas, which is, I think, why the name superficial angiomyxoma is apt, because you will see a lot more vascularity, and they tend to be these branching um, vessels in this multilobular, hypocellular, myxoid, bland spindle cell proliferation, okay? And the vessels, um, the branching vessels in the myxoid could make you worry a little bit about myxoid liposarcoma, but really only if you've never seen a myxoid liposarcoma, because once you've seen one, this doesn't look anything like, I mean, there's blue and hypocellular, and it's got some vessels, but the pattern is really quite different. Also, I, I have never personally seen a myxoid liposarcoma in the skin. Um, it has been rarely, rarely reported, but I've never encountered one, and I've diagnosed many myxoid liposarcomas in my career. They are almost always deep intramuscular lesions below the fascia, very rarely in the subcutis, um, but in any case, extremely rare. And the vessels here, even though they are branchy, they are much thicker walled than the very delicate uh, capillary sized vessels of a myxoid liposarcoma, okay? So in any case, we do have abundant vessels that branch, bland spindle cells, hypocellular with a myxoid background, usually multilobular, sometimes the lobules will get a lot of like sclerosis or fibrosis dividing them. We're beginning to see that subtly here. Like see there's pink collagen kind of wrapping around this lobule. So the multilobularity is pretty helpful. Um, other things you can see, but you don't always see is scattered um, uh, neutrophils. It's a really great finding because not a lot of things have scattered random neutrophils in the background. We see scattered lymphocytes and all sorts of stuff, but scattered neutrophils is kind of unique. Okay, so if you see something like this and then there's scattered neutrophils floating around in the myxoid stuff, that's a great clue for cutaneous myxoma, aka superficial angiomyxoma. Um, uh, the one caveat I'd make is if you've got an ulcer on the surface of a lesion and there's some, you know, neutrophils impetigenizing the surface of the ulcer, well, guess what? You're going to see scattered neutrophils in the dermis down beneath, regardless of what it is, because the neutrophils have to come out of the vessels to get up to the ulcer surface. So anything ulcerated, the kind of scattered neutrophils it is kind of uh, is off the table. Like you may see them, but they don't mean anything necessarily, right? So that's one clue, though, especially for test and real life purposes. If you see scattered neutrophils in this myxoid lesion, that's a great clue for angiomyxoma, cutaneous myxoma. Uh, like many myxoid things, mast cells are often hanging around, but that's true. If you see blue myxoid stuff, you're often going to see mast cells in the background. That's just a kind of mast cells. Mast cells are like pigs. They like to wallow in mucin, is what Ron Rapini always liked to say. And uh, I think that's kind of funny. And, you know, for anyone watching this, a pathologist, I, in Dermpath, we use the terms mucin and myxoid kind of interchangeably. So if you hear me say mucin, I, I mean myxoid. I don't mean epithelial mucin. I mean this glycosaminoglycan stuff that we're looking at in the background. The last thing, this one doesn't have it, but sometimes a subset of cases, maybe 25% or so of cutaneous myxoma, superficial angiomyxoma will have entrapment um, and of adnexal structures, often with kind of distortion or cystic change in dilation of those. That can either be sweat ducts um, or hair follicle type structures with cystic change, sometimes with keratin granulomas because they rupture. And so finding those things in the background of a myxoid lesion like this is a great clue for superficial angiomyxoma. Some people, uh, Tim McCalmont made me aware of this uh, online on Kiko, he posted about this, that, that, that some cases, uh, and he believes that, that some of these things that have been called superficial angiomyxoma with entrapted nexal structures maybe actually represent 
adnexal tumors like uh, variations of trichodiscoma or other hair follicle tumor that have abundant myxoid stroma. So it's kind of a chicken or egg question. And I have seen some cases. I, I'm glad he brought that up because I, I didn't know how I felt about that at first. Maybe it's because I'm biased as a soft tissue pathologist and wanting to make things into soft tissue tumors. But uh, I have seen cases that really looked like angiomyxoma and then later on excision really looked like they had uh, a hair follicle proliferation. So I don't know which name we give them. They are benign either way. Uh, but I think it's worth knowing that that overlap exists and uh, there have been questions about what the actual origin is of some of these. And I would I would like to bring up that in this case, even though we don't have entrapted nexal structures, look what we have up top. We've got this kind of poorly formed, once it comes into focus, um, hair follicle epithelium kind of on the surface. It will show blue basaloid cells with palisading and probably some stromal condensation underneath if it ever comes into focus. Well, that's what's happening there, just trust me. In any case, uh, so just interesting, almost like the induction change of follicular induction over a dermatofibroma. So uh, these are interesting. The, the main uh, problems that people have here are, are these, okay? Number one, if you get a small sample, how do I know it's this versus, say, other myxoid things like pretibial myxedema or focal cutaneous uh, mucinosis, aka focal dermal mucinosis? Well, number one, uh, it doesn't hugely matter to tell focal cutaneous mucinosis from superficial angiomyxoma. I would say this, multinodular, prominent vessels, larger, extending deeper, all those things would make me want to call it cutaneous myxoma, superficial angiomyxoma. Uh, if it's just a small intradermal uh, hypocellular myxoid area without many vessels, I would probably just call it a focal cutaneous mucinosis. Occasionally on a small shave, I've said bland hypocellular myxoid um, proliferation or, or myx hypocellular myxoid uh, lesion and that I can't tell if it's a superficial angiomyxoma or a cutaneous or focal dermal mucinosis. And then it probably doesn't really matter. If you've got clinical and it's a tiny papule, it's probably just focal mucinosis, which is just an incidental curiosity uh, that gets biopsied to make, because sometimes people wonder if it's a nevus or something else. All right. Um, the other problem is that, uh, that um, sometimes you can have areas in myxofibrosarcoma in the low grade end of myxofibrosarcoma, you can have areas that look quite similar to this. They can be hypocellular, bland, and myxoid. So if you see something that looks like this and it's on the extremity of an elderly adult and you're only seeing a partial sample, you may want to say, I don't see any atypia here, but it's broadly transected at the edge of the, the biopsy and I can't evaluate the entire lesion. And if there's any, if, it, if it's a big, deep mass, it may be worth going and removing it or getting a much deeper biopsy to make sure that there's no atypia. Because mix of fibrosarcomas uh, often involve the skin on the extremities of older adults, and they can be very hypocellular and bland in some areas. And then once you see more of it, you can see that they're infiltrative and have atypia. And they can be a management problem and they require large surgery with big margins. So that can be problematic. And what you want to see for those is really big, ugly, hyperchromatic cells. You must have at least some ugly, hyperchromatic spindle cells to make a diagnosis of even grade one mix of fibrosarc. It must have some pleomorphism or else you can't diagnose it without that, okay? Here we have a couple cells that are a little bit bigger. That's not what I'm talking about. They got to be like ugly cells, okay? So you can see I've got examples of that on Kiko. And then the last thing that comes up with these, and I know I'm belaboring this, but that's because I see people struggle with myxoid lesions, particularly this entity, a lot. Because they wonder, is it something else? Is it this? And what does this mean? And do I have to worry about Carney syndrome? Yeah, Carney syndrome will often present with cutaneous myxomas, but they will often have multiple myxomas or they'll have myxomas, particularly in a couple of sites the ear, near the eye, or on the nipple. For some reason, Carney syndrome patients tend to develop myxomas in those sites. So when I see a solitary superficial angiomyxoma, I don't always say that, oh, they have to screen the person for Carney. Sometimes I will mention that these can be seen in the context of Carney syndrome, uh, but particularly if they're, they're in one of those three anatomic sites. And the last thing is, what about deep or so-called aggressive angiomyxoma of the, the genitals? Usually in, in women, in the vulva, the difference is the size and location. Superficial angiomyxoma is going to be a couple centimeters, and in the skin, maybe pushing down into the from the dermis to the subcutis. Aggressive deep angiomyxoma or air quotes aggressive angiomyxoma uh, 
because they're not really aggressive. The problem is that they're big and deep and because of that, they're hard to remove because they grow into the pelvic soft tissue around the vagina, around the uterus. So they are a deep soft tissue thing that sometimes pushes up to the skin. So the biggest difference there is the clinical information. How big and deep is this? If there's any doubt, you can recommend an ultrasound or, or some other imaging study or just, you know, clinical exam. If this is a small nodule that's two centimeters on the vulva, it's going to be a superficial angiomyxoma. And yes, these can occur on the vulva and in the genitals, okay? They also, these uh, deep angiomyxomas, in my experience, and I've not seen many of them, but they don't look this myxoid. They usually look more like a demodus pink, pink collagen with, with pale edema areas, and they have vessels of varying size, including big, thick wall vessels, and they're very deep into the soft tissue and large. Okay, and they also, I think, usually have HMGA2 mutations. So if there's doubt, you could send out for that. I've not used that personally, but it is a clue that you could, a test you could use if you were struggling. But I, I feel like people often send in any sort of myxoid lesion in the genitals, and they're always worried about a deep angiomyxoma. And I would say most of the consult cases I've seen over the years that were sent in for rule out deep angiomyxoma ended up being something else, not deep angiomyxoma. So it's important entity to keep in mind, but I think that it's often overly worried about and ends up being something else. So I don't know if that is helpful, but there's some features that you can you can use. And I've got examples of, of a true example of deep angiomyxoma and a video on Kiko.